We may be on the other side of the holiday season, but that doesn't mean we can't find reasons to celebrate. There's Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day, engagement parties, retirement celebrations, Mondays, Fridays. Another thing to celebrate, we are living in 2023, a time when those libations that add to celebrations can be delivered to your door. No more missing out on jokes or games because you had to get more wine. No more putting on pants to leave your house while in the middle of binging a show. In less than an hour, Drizzly can have beer, wine, and spirits delivered to your home. Simply use the number one alcohol delivery app, Drizzly. Place your order and boom, start that next episode and you'll be enjoying a beverage before it's over. So download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com and get your favorite drinks delivered today. This is Murder in the Rain, where each week Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough tell true crime stories of the Pacific Northwest. Murder in the Rain contains graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. Though there is no comprehensive national database documenting these events, it is estimated 11 murder-suicides occur in the U.S. every week. Nine out of ten involve a firearm, two-thirds are at the hand of an intimate partner, and the annual toll from these incidents is 1,200 lives. Today, I'll be talking about three of these incidents, all occurring in Oregon, which illustrate just how explosive and devastating those losses can be, as well as the myriad of factors that may help to light the fuse. Mitra Maribadi often worked on the weekend, and Saturday, October 22nd, 2016, was no different, as she left for work around 6.30 that morning to get to her job at the Liberty Center office building in the Lloyd District area of Portland, on the northeast side of town, where she had worked for the last three years as an insurance claim processor for Liberty Mutual. Mitra's family had moved to the United States from Iran, where Mitra had earned a master's in library science while attending school at Ferdowsi University of Mashhad, Iran. It wasn't long after moving to Portland that she got the job at the Liberty Center. As she walked out the door of their Lake Oswego home for the last time, her husband, Mortiza Rezai, also known as Mori, told her goodbye. She did the same, and was probably quiet as she did, so as not to wake their young daughter, Parmina. There wasn't much planned for that day, except Parmina had a recital in the afternoon, which Mitra was expected to attend after work. At 4 p.m., Mori was unable to get a hold of Mitra, and she missed the recital. Worried, Maury went to the Liberty Center building, which is in a fairly ideal location for city living. You're right at the soon-to-be-defunct Lloyd Center Mall, which is adjacent to a Max Line, Portland's public light rail system, which runs through the area, able to take passengers way west to Hillsboro, out east to Gresham, north to the airport, or south to Milwaukee. The neighborhood contains plenty of stores, local-owned shops, bars, cafes, and restaurants, all just a river crossing away from downtown Portland. When Maury arrived at the building, he encountered security guard Ben Robinson, and when Maury handed Ben a photo of Mitra and explained he could not reach his wife, Ben thought to himself that perhaps Mitra was off with someone doing extramarital things Maury wouldn't care for. Learning of her office floor and location, Robinson made his way upstairs to check on her and to at least report back to the distraught husband whether or not she was in the office. Turning the corner to Mitra's cubicle, Ben made an unexpected and distressing discovery. Mitra's body lying on the floor. She was face down with an apparent bullet wound in her head. In shock, Ben backed away and found a phone to call 911. He informed the operator that the person appeared to have died from suicide. Within minutes, Portland police officers arrived to secure the scene. They came in hot, accompanied by Ben, who had the access key card to the floor on which Mitra worked. As they passed through the foyer on the lobby floor, Maury frantically pled for them to tell him his wife was okay, or at the very least, what the hell was going on, but they could offer no information. Detectives arrived. One was Brian Steed, and the other you might recognize from Alicia's Patreon episode, Nibble with the Knife, or her appearances in the Wonderland Murders on ID Channel, which I watched as part of this episode's research, Detective Michelle Michaels. 
she broke the news to Maury that his wife, mother to their young daughter, was dead. They interviewed Maury, then informed him they would be looking over the scene swiftly to figure out what kind of crime, if any, they were dealing with. Once the detectives got to Mitra's body, they knew pretty quickly they were not dealing with a suicide. It was easy to see why security guard Ben Johnson would have thought that, the shot to the head. But upon closer examination, the detectives discovered several additional gunshot wounds on Mitra's body, one clearly visible in the center of her back. Four shell casings lay around Mitra like an outline in brass. Processing the building, investigators found there were only four entrances, including a garage. Using the security recordings of staff badges, they were able to get a list of all employees who had swiped their cards for access that day, and they had to figure out whether the killer sneaked into the building or if they already had access. While still processing the office as a crime scene, the detectives came across a clue that was like something out of a movie. On a large dry erase board, the words already dead were written four times in red marker. Next to the writing, a skull and crossbones. Four lines written, maybe one for each bullet in Mitra's body. They didn't know who wrote the seemingly sinister note, only that it seemed at least very likely Mitra's killer had left it to antagonize investigators and gloat about the murder. Maury stayed at the scene, eventually getting moved into a conference room for more questioning. Going through the list of employees, Detectives Steed and Michaels found a handful that were closer to Mitra and wanted to interview them immediately. First, there were the underwriters, Josh Allenwood and Brett Handler. Mitra, Josh, and Brett had been hired at the same time and even went through onboarding training together. Eventually, Mitra and Brett became close work friends, even carpooling from time to time. At some point, Maury's work schedule changed, leaving Mitra to pick her daughter up after work and ending the carpooling with Brett. As for Josh, well, he wanted the promotion Mitra ended up gaining, which Josh resented. Then there was Jim Morgan. He had been at the company for 20 years and had just a few more left until retirement. He and his wife Diane loved to imagine what their work-free future would look like together. Jim and Mitra became work friends, which led to hanging out outside their workplace, even having couples dinners together. And though there was around a 15-year age gap between the couples, the group of four became friends and maybe even more like a family, as Jim had even loaned the couple money to buy a car. For some reason, things started to get weird at work between Brett Handler and Jim Morgan. Nothing too serious, just a few bizarre annoyances, like how Jim would scare, or as we call it in our house, boogity, Brett. Other times he would wrap his fingers along the top of Brett's cubicle as he walked by, and Brett, frustrated, asked him to stop, and Jim responded, I will if you will. Jim's animosity towards Brett was then directed at Mitra. He warned her to stay away from him, insinuating there was something extramarital going on between her and Brett, which there wasn't. Although Brett had at some point mentioned being interested in Mitra romantically, which she shut down right away. As time went on, Jim had become infatuated with Mitra. Even when she went to lunch with Maury, she would catch him following and watching them. Although Jim made her uncomfortable, she may have felt she had nothing to be fearful of, as she never mentioned it to Maury. Or perhaps, some fear about the situation had creeped in, and she hoped it would resolve itself over time and fade away. Best not to stir things up. Or a similar, totally understandable thought. I think it's so creepy that he would, like, tap the guy's cubicle. Jim? That's so, yeah, that's so, like, menacing. But you can't do anything. Like, well, it's maybe, not like you can report it. Maybe you know? Jim saw something that the other guy was doing that was creepy towards her. And that's what kind of set him off. And that's just, could you imagine though, you're sitting at your cubicle and every time this dude walks by, he taps on you? Ugh. Yeah, I would get annoyed. I hate working in a cubicle. <laughs> it's been a long time, <laughs> but I did it for a while and it sucked. Back to the investigation. A solution was presented regarding the already dead message scrawled on an office whiteboard. Of all the strange, upsetting coincidences, it turned out to be a joke. A coworker had written the not work appropriate joke on the board referencing a missing stapler, one of those locals-only jokes that are never funny when you have to explain them. Checking the surveillance video that covered the corridors of the building, the footage showed maintenance workers and an employee or two coming in for some weekend work, nothing out of the ordinary. But footage of the emergency stairwell showed an unidentified male walking up them around 8.45 a.m., which was odd, as the elevator was working just fine. Another employee, 
Keely Tubbs, a work friend and sometime lunchmate of Mitra's, was seen entering the building that same morning. Later in the day, Keely saw news coverage regarding the only hours-old murder, and she called police to report what she knew of the events. Keeley worked on the same floor as Mitra, but on the opposite corner, and at some point during that morning, she heard a high-pitched, childlike scream, later telling detectives she simply thought, what the hell was that, and resumed her work. But she didn't, she didn't report hearing gunshots? From what I, from what I understood, she, she didn't hear them. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know if but maybe the- it was small the, caliber, right? It was, not, it, was a, it, was? it was a nine millimeter- and I was just thinking maybe it was uh, contact. If he was, if he was, oh, if, if he had it pressed against close. her, yeah, then maybe that would have Never muffled really it. Muffled a yeah. silencer or something. I'm interested to see where this goes. Keeley also reported that she ran into affable coworker Jim Morgan in the office that Saturday, around 9:07 a.m. When she encountered him a short while after hearing this strange scream, she asked if he had heard it as well. He said he did, then took off in a hurry exiting via the same stairwell it was later learned from security video he'd climbed not more than 20 minutes earlier. I knew that guy was rotten. Jim Morgan then drove about a mile away from the office, parked, sat in his car, and called 911. What's going on there? Um, look for a black four-door sedan. No, no, that's not how this works. You have to tell me what the emergency is. Man with a gun, then. There's somebody there with a gun. Are you seeing this person now? I'm the one with a gun. I'm happy to send you help. I just need you to tell me a little bit about what's going on today. Just do it, dummy. Officers responding to the location of the call found Jim Morgan's body in his car. He had used the same type of gun that had killed Mitra to take his own life. The detectives informed Diane, Jim's wife, that the husband she was so excited to grow old with was dead and that he died a killer. That Saturday morning, Diane said Jim got out of bed early for a weekend day. It was around 8 a.m. when he hurried off, saying he was leaving to buy wood to repair their fence. With a kiss goodbye, he was gone. As confusing as everything was, the motive seemed clear. Jim had become obsessed with Mitra, was perhaps even stalking her. At the very least, he knew her work schedule, and he could not stand that she had a friendship with Brett Handler. According to Detective Michaels, quote, when Jim Morgan thought that Mitra liked Brett and that Brett liked her, he just became explosive. Diane Morgan later said, Jim turned into somebody that I didn't know. I don't have any insights. I don't have any clues. I don't have anything. It's unclear whether because of their immigration status or from the toll of the emotional trauma at the violent loss of Mitra Maribadi, but not long after the murder, Mori and their daughter Parmina moved back to Iran. Sadly, cases of murder-suicide are more common than you might think. According to the Oregon Violent Death Reporting System, or ORVDERS, between 2003 and 2020, 167 events of murder-suicide occurred, resulting in 354 deaths. Mitra Maribadi's case is one in the minority, as 81% of these cases occur in the home. Quote, Overenmeshment is a condition in which perpetrators either view their family members as possessions that they control, or they don't see any boundaries between their identity, their wife, and their children. And so these are suicides of the entire family, where the overly enmeshed individual can't bear to leave the pain behind, and so takes his wife and children with him. If you've ever driven the Interstate 84 East from Portland to Boise, you have, perhaps unknowingly, passed through Hermiston. While it's small compared to some cities, its population of nearly 20,000 makes it the largest city in eastern Oregon. It's also known for its wrestling. In the mid-2010s, their program in the 5A division was unstoppable. Those divisions are calculated based on wins and school sizes. Even more impressive, in February of 2016, the Hermiston High Bulldogs brought home their 10th state championship, continuing a winning streak in the last 9 out of 10 years. An incoming freshman in 2016, James J.J. Hurtado had been wrestling since he was three years old, and now, at 14, would be joining a championship team with a strong legacy to uphold. J.J. was every bit a 14-year-old, with his lanky limbs, a part-time job at Foot Locker, a mouthful of braces, and a dusting of a mustache on his upper lip. But his older sister pointed out his level of maturity, 
which was high for his age, saying she would often turn to him for advice with relationship problems or when she'd had a bad day. JJ's grandfather lived in Umatilla, just shy of seven miles north of Hermiston. Umatilla sits on Oregon and Washington's natural border, the Columbia River, and is home to the Two Rivers Correctional Institution, Hat Rock State Park, which surprisingly features a big hat-shaped rock, and the Hermiston Family Aquatic Center, quote, the premier water park in eastern Oregon. It was August 18th, 2016, around 10 a.m., when 45-year-old Jason Houston drove to J.J.'s grandfather's home in Umatilla to pick up J.J., and they then drove to McKay Park in Umatilla to play a round of disc golf. They started driving south, but instead of getting to the Frisbee golf course, Jason pulled over and parked on a vacant road, Country Lane in Hermiston, just east of Interstate 82. Earlier that morning, Jason had taken it upon himself to change plans. Jason Houston texted his friend Lane Wade Camper about using some of his nearby ranch property for shooting practice, which was a common occurrence. Lane gave the okay but couldn't join them as he was busy that day, but he did later note to police that the morning of the shooting, he saw Jason driving really slowly on the highway that was adjacent to the ranch. Houston and JJ arrived at the unofficial but oft-used shooting range around 11 a.m. They got out of the vehicle before, out of the blue, Jason revealed a 9mm handgun, shooting JJ once, which ended his life. Perhaps as planned as the shooting, Jason dragged JJ's body to an obscure spot and covered it with vegetation. He then drove four miles from the property to an apartment parking lot where he left his vehicle and then walked 100 yards to 130 Northeast 11th Street, which from a Google search appears to be a quaint four-bedroom, 1,800-square-foot home. Reaching the home, Jason kicked the front door in and made his way to the primary bedroom. Still in bed were a man and a woman. They were beyond startled by the noise of first the front door and then their bedroom door exploding inward. The man leapt from the bed as Jason entered the room. Jason responded by shooting the man three times. He was dead as his body fell to the floor. To the woman, Houston said he would let her live so she could raise her daughter, but shortly after saying this, he shot her in the back. She was eventually taken to a hospital for treatment and ended up surviving her injuries. Jason Houston remained in the house and called his mother, who called 911 after they spoke. After speaking with his mom, Jason also called 911 to report the shooting, before sitting on the couple's bed and shooting himself with the same handgun used in the attacks. Police responded and made a high-risk entry into the home, finding the crime scene in the bedroom. Lane Wade Camper, who'd given the okay for Jason to use his property's shooting range that day, answered the knock at his door that evening. It was JJ's younger sister asking if Lane had seen her brother or Jason Houston. Lane had only seen Jason that morning when he eerily drove past his ranch on the highway. She told him that JJ and Jason were together that morning and that they couldn't find Jason. Minutes after she left to continue her search, a hard thought struck Lane. I have to go check the shooting range. He went to the area and searched around, but didn't find any signs of foul play. Tracks in the dirt, though, showed that Houston had driven there recently. Lane then hurried back to his truck, where he called police and spoke to a state investigator, telling them they should respond to his location, which they did. Jason's arrival at the home on 11th Street was not accidental, nor was it a random attack. Just like Jason, 45-year-old Kenneth Valdez was also a volunteer wrestling coach at the high school. That was the man who had been in the bed before being shot. And the woman was Andrea Bai, J.J. Hurtado's mother. Oh. It turned out Jason and Kenneth had been not just best friends, but lifelong friends who had wrestled together back in the day as Hermiston Bulldogs. The morning he was shot, J.J. was at Hermiston High, registering for classes. In less than two weeks, he'd be a Bulldog, and he was already way ahead of the high school game. During the summer, J.J. started working out with the Hermiston wrestling team, and in that course, made many, many friends. J.J. was fortunate, he thought, to have an in with the team. Jason Houston was not only a volunteer coach who had a state championship under his singlet, but he told J.J. he (laughs) saw varsity potential in him. That was clever. Oh, (laughs) And the icing on top? Jason had previously dated Andrea Bai, J.J.'s mom. So the two guys are lifelong friends. They're both volunteer coaches. One dated 
the kid's mom. Yeah, Jason dated they, her first, and then and Kenneth then did Kenneth. after their relationship fell apart. Yeah, that sounds like a small town. Yeah. Jason Houston had been like a father to JJ. He and Andrea Bai, who'd been shot in the back in the minutes after Kenneth Valdez was killed, had dated for several years. And his motivation for the shooting? He was upset that Kenneth and Andrea had begun dating. Post-searching Jason's house in the aftermath of the murders and suicide, Hermiston Police Chief Edmonston said, quote, We do know an incredible amount of pills were discovered at Houston's residence for things like depression and anxiety. These medications were prescribed to aid the post-traumatic stress Houston was deeply affected by from his time as a Marine in the 90s during the first Gulf War. Jason was a graduate of Hermiston High, as was Kenneth Valdez, both graduating in the class of 1989. And Jason's passion for the school's wrestling program never diminished, which may have been a little red flag, but, you know, what do I know? Yeah, it's hard to, especially in a small town like that, where it's like sports are everything. So if he did well on the team and then life just let him down. Yeah, and then it's like, but I was a champ wrestler. Umatilla County Sheriff's Office investigators responded to Lane Wade Camper's call and searched the shooting range area of his property where they discovered J.J.'s body under a camouflage of dried brush a little after 8 p.m. J.J.'s father, Leonard Hurtado, had never been a fan of Jason Houston. He felt he was too hard on J.J., pushing him past exhaustion as they trained for the teen's leap into high school wrestling, at least once making J.J. run on a treadmill until he blacked out. Oh, my and God. It, yeah, and another time forcing him to do push-ups until he couldn't pick himself up off the floor. Well, that's child abuse. Yeah. And uh, also, according to J.J.'s father, uh, Jason Houston made J.J. call him dad. Oh, Ugh. that's a big red flag. Huge. Oof. J.J.'s grandfather told investigators Jason Houston felt betrayed by J.J. as he wasn't doing enough to break up the relationship between Andrea Bai <laughs> and Kenneth Valdez. As yeah, that's, that's his... his job. Yeah, good grief. Recovering from the shooting, Andrea Bai said Houston had been trying to manipulate her children into breaking up the new relationship. So he was just fully abusive all the way around. And notes to parents, like, it, maybe don't let your teenage son hang out with some 40-year-old used-to-be wrestler because he's so interested in training him. Like, that's Yeah, even odd. as a coach, that's you should have boundaries. Like, that stays Especially at school. Especially in summer, if there aren't other kids involved. Mm -hmm. Like, one-on-one, -on -one, no way. And it's your ex-dad figure. Yeah, no way. Mm My favorite holiday of the year is just around the corner. Valentine's Day? Uh, my birthday, duh. And when it comes to Valentine's Day slash the sacred day of my birth, nothing hits the spot like candy. But of course, this year I'm off the sugary stuff, so thank goodness for Native. I'm loving Native's new limited edition candy shop collection. Like all Native products, they are thoughtfully formulated to keep me feeling and smelling deliciously fresh all day long. You know Native for their aluminum-free deodorant. Native keeps their ingredients list bare naked using only coconut oil, shea butter, milk of magnesia, and baking soda, which means it's safe for you and your skin, even if it's sensitive. Native deodorant offers 72-hour odor protection, naturally derived ingredients, and a smooth residue-free application with an array of scents to choose from. The new limited edition candy shop collection includes four new scents, gummy bears, strawberry and vanilla taffy, sour berry belt, and sweet cinnamon hearts. Normally, I'm all about the eucalyptus and mint scent, but I think I'm gonna have to switch it up because the sour berry belt is sweet and tangy, just like me. I'm all about the strawberry and vanilla taffy. It smells just like the real thing, delicious. This Valentine's Day, you can be the sweet treat with Native. Right now, go to nativedo.com slash rain or use promo code rain at checkout to get a sweet 20% off your first order. That's nativedeo.com slash rain or use promo code rain at checkout for 20% off your first order. Back in December of 2009, Jason Houston was arrested and charged with menacing and unlawful possession of a firearm, to which he pleaded no contest. The menacing charge was dropped, and he was sentenced only to probation 
and 20 hours of community service. By 2014, he was unemployed, with his only income being the veterans' benefits he received monthly. To occupy his time while doing what he loved with the people he loved, he signed up, just a year after Kenneth, to join the volunteer coaching staff of the Bulldogs. Kenneth Valdez, a 25-year UPS employee, was known as the Dancing Bear, possibly in reference to his wrestling style, as he was larger than life, friendly, kind, and really tough to take down in a match. The shooting had been the crescendo of the recent violence Jason had been inflicting on Andrea. Just days before the shooting, he pulled her hair, grabbed her face, and pinned her against a car. A family member of Jason's, interviewed after his death, referenced that physical attack by saying Jason was, quote, going to do what he did today, on that day, but no one believed him. After the shootings of not only their peer JJ, but two of their coaches, counselors and psychologists were made available to students and staff at Hermiston High. Looking into Jason's history with the Department of Veterans Affairs, there was documentation stating he had claimed to be angry about not only losing the relationship he had with Andrea Bai, but losing his partner to his best friend. However, he denied having any homicidal or suicidal thoughts surrounding it. His counselor suggested he remove all the weapons from his home, and according to a family member, he did just that, putting the weapons in his truck and leaving the truck with family. The Bulldogs resumed their wrestling program the season after the loss of JJ and Kenneth and Jason. In remembrance, there was even a team member who wore JJ's singlet during tournaments the following season. JJ lives on, not just in the memories of his family and friends, but his older half-sister had a baby and named him Xander James in honor of James J.J. Hurtado. J.J.'s father Leonard said, quote, I think he would have had a good life if he had the chance. Quote, Suicide experts say there are two basic kinds of murder-suicides. The most common involves domestic violence, in which a dominating partner, motivated by jealousy, anger, and paranoia, kills the other partner and then him or herself. The vast majority of these are committed by men. Less common are mercy-killing murder-suicides, in which a couple, often frail, elderly, and desperate, agree to die together. Some see it as an act of love. Terry Daniel moved to Oregon in the 1970s. He worked as a custodian and often had to pick up a second job to provide for his two sons, whom he raised by himself. In 2009, Terry met Lisa Stevie Haynes, a former truck driver who was struggling financially as well as with her health. Lisa was houseless and living in a lot behind Terry's house, which was a unit in a mobile home park, and that was how they met. Eventually, Terry took Lisa into his home, and from that moment on, the pair were attached at the hip. But in 2011, Lisa, who was epileptic, began having such violent seizures she injured her neck, which required surgery and some time spent in a physical rehabilitation center. Oh my gosh, yeah. from a seizure? From seizures, yeah, they were just oh so out of control. God. During this time, Lisa's mobility issues worsened, and she became unable to walk on her own, needing to use a wheelchair to get around. The couple was surviving, barely, on social security disability checks and living hand to mouth. Neither one had savings or a pension they could rely on. Luckily, the mobile home park where they lived had a food pantry and donation program that could help them. It was crushing, though, that every aspect of their lives seemed dictated by their lack of funds. In this same time period, Terry had to start using a walker to get around. He was only 60, but a life spent doing heavy physical work had worn his body down. Terry was Lisa's only caregiver, and the addition of his mobility issues put a massive strain on their lives. They had no one else to lean on, and they were each too unwell to be of help to the other. While Lisa recovered from surgery at the physical rehabilitation facility, Terry took a bus daily to visit with her. For some time alone in their own home, he was allowed to bring her back to their Milwaukee home every Sunday. 55-year-old Lisa was eventually discharged from the rehab center. This was February 12, 2012 and 61-year-old Terry Daniel, as always, was there and ready to take her home. They made it back a little before 6 p.m., and needing to call his son, Terry used a neighbor's phone, but there was no answer. Terry went back to their mobile home, where both he and Lisa made an audio recording, 
Then, Terry took a small caliber pistol and shot Lisa Haynes once in the chest, killing her. He then turned the gun on himself, firing into his chest. Hearing the gunshots, neighbors called 911 and sheriff's deputies responded. Lisa was confirmed dead at the scene, and Terry, still alive, was taken to a hospital for treatment. It was confusing to those who knew the loving couple as to how this could have happened. Then investigators listened to the recording they had made. In it, the couple stated their intentions to die together. Terry survived his injuries, and a grand jury agreed that he should be charged with murder. But instead of going to trial, he took a plea deal, which dropped the murder charge, and he ended up being sentenced to 10 years. In a statement to the court, Terry expressed his sadness that the governor at the time was in office, as otherwise, he would have requested a death penalty. As of the time of this recording, I don't see Terry Daniel listed as an inmate, nor could I find an obituary, so I can only assume he served most of his time and is out, hopefully, living a better life. It just seems odd, not odd, I, I mean, murder is murder, and she had a family, but if you have someone recording something saying, I agree, this is what I want to do, I am in pain, I can't move, we can't take care of each other, we have no one to help us, there's no system in place to take care of us, what choice do we have, and this is what I want. And like getting assisted suicide from a doctor yeah. is expensive and hard to go Very through. Very hard to do. You know, so... It, it is it's so hard because you can see you can see the reasons why. Well, and the last thing it. she would want by agreeing to that would be that he had to go to jail for 10 years. Yeah. And he has to live with that. You know, that's um, that's rough. And his body in prison, like he already had mobility issues. But no I mean, way. the positive to being in prison is he did have access to some health care. That's that, true. Like maybe there was the positive side of it. Yeah. He had food. He had a place to stay. That's true. Yeah, maybe found some. Hopefully, people a were reason nice to go to, to continue. Yeah. yeah, what you guys are talking about—that's the the Death with Dignity Act, the uh, doctor assisted suicide, and like you said, yeah, super strict guidelines. So you have to be under a doctor's care, and then two doctors must determine if you're capable of making medical decisions, and then those doctors have to agree that the patient has a terminal illness that will lead to death within six months. And then the request must be made orally and on two occasions, 15 days apart, along with a written request signed by two witnesses. So it's yeah. not something you can just do. Honestly, if I felt like, if I felt that was my option, I'd probably, do, I'm not going to yeah. do all that other stuff. Yeah. No, yeah. thank you, doc. I know that I'm dying. Now, yeah. if you're dying from cancer and you already have all these doctors and your family's already on board with you, that's a scenario that might be, yeah. might go smoothly. Mm -hmm. But yeah. if you're, having trouble even having health care. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? If you have six months now, obviously they didn't qualify for that because they were just, mm -hmm. not just, but they were only immobile. It's like a quality of life. Yeah, issue. exactly. But uh, even that, like two doctors, do you know how hard it is to get appointments? I'm dealing with two different doctors in the same field and it's like ridiculous trying to get everybody to communicate. And I have the skill sets, I have the access, I have the financial ability, I have the insurance. Like, I'm way ahead, and it's a pain. Mm -hmm. So, like, <laughs> imagine having that disadvantage. Yeah. And, like, hey, I've got six months, oh, three months now. Could we get a move on it, guys? But I am pro that act. And I understand, oh, I, am too. I understand why it's thorough. Obviously, you don't want to be just like, it's a big decision to yeah. decide you want to end your life willy nilly giving out pills, but. Mm -hmm. It's certainly a better option than your family finding you like a different way or something, you know, or we could have preventative measures in place so people don't have to get to that point. Where we, where we take care of them when they're older and have health issues something and stuff like that. just so that they are okay. Or allow to access to medication and medical support before it gets to the point of. That would be wonderful. Yeah. That's called Canada, I think. A study conducted in 2010 by the National Institute of Justice found that intimate partner violence had previously occurred in 70% of these cases. Other risk factors for murder-suicides are access to firearms, relationship estrangement, a stepchild in the home, and unemployment following a history of domestic violence. Most perpetrators of murder-suicides are non-Hispanic white males. A stepchild? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that causes Definitely. major How interesting. Turmoil. I not really thought of that. I mean, obviously it would. Of it like... was, I was not physically abused, but it was rough having a step-parent in, in my relationship. Like, I 
I wouldn't do that to my child. Yeah, nor would I. I I had a, I wonder how similar a situation, but I had a, a step parent that was just a real dickhead. <laughs> real, God, I hate her. That's a, Yeah, I hadn't thought, obviously that would add to it, but. I just never understood. It's like, why, why are you in this with this person if I'm a part of the deal and you're not yeah. really going to be cool? What the fuck? Ugh, God. I don't, I don't think, sometimes I think it's, uh, they're not equipped to handle it. So when you're a new parent, you're growing along with your child, right? Imagine just having like a full blown asshole teenager just dropped in your lap. Right. Some people are not equipped to handle that. They, they have no idea what it's like even having someone live in their home with them. And then suddenly they have a family and add on things like alcoholism and parenting styles alone. Yeah, I mean, you like as a, a someone looking in on what my life was like, like I could see the factors that led to like explosive anger outbursts and things like it makes sense. But it's so unfair to children. Like I'd, I I just wouldn't do I wouldn't bring someone into my home until she's grown. Yeah. And, like no offense to those that do. I know some step parents are amazing. Like I have one that's amazing, but. I don't know. Yeah, it's complicated. It's dangerous if you don't know how someone's going to react. You don't know how they're going to be. Well, yeah, like the wrestler guy. Yeah. Like <laughs> they could seem like a totally great person who enjoy taking to the movies or, you know, being that right. fun parent. But if things go south and you've never seen them act out, you've never seen them high on drugs or on alcohol, you, it's just too dangerous. Well, and I think that's what's interesting about these cases, Josh, is we so often like even in my own life, the person I know that was killed, it was this situation. It was a murder-suicide. It was the boyfriend. She was leaving. And those, I feel like if you asked people, like, what what a common situation is, it would be that. But it is so interesting to hear these other ones, not only, like, the health, but, you know, the obsession. And I'm going to stalk you at work and mm. follow you everywhere. And so it's kind of it's helpful in that way because instead of well I'm not in an abusive relationship so it's all good it's like well what are the red flags of people around you you know of being mm-hmm. possessive or forcing you know oh my friend's new partner forces the kid to call him dad like no <laughs> you know not that that's anything on any of the victims but it's more like I think it's interesting for Things us to, to look hear out yeah for. it's educational learning to be like, from other people's terrible situations exactly like What could have happened if the wife, you know, she didn't want to feel, oh, I'm just at work and this guy is goofy and follows me around and he's he's older. He we're you know he paid for our car. Like I'm not going to make it a thing. Maybe the the cultural differences between them. Mm. Maybe she didn't understand. Is like, is this what people are like here? Right. Am I am I taking this the wrong way? Yeah. Is this like a typical American man that's abrasive or? intrusive well, but or... i think Probably. that financial yeah. element really does play a role because like you want to keep him happy in a way uh-huh. so by not bringing it up and stirring the pot yeah and exactly hoping it will stop yeah and again that's not to say like she could have prevented it or something but just knowing like well, no one wants to things. think people have it in them to be exactly. like exactly that. that's what i always say i'm like i never say never about anybody it could be any buddy for any and yeah thing. the majority of them will have red flags that looking hindsight you're like right. okay i saw it coming but there are cases where there was none yeah it's hidden away or or you just ignore it because yeah i don't want that guy to be that i don't want him to be a creep i like being family friends yeah we have good dinners together he's kind to us yeah he helps us it, like i feel like i can understand that scenario it totally. is a little I was taken aback when you said Brett, he had said that he had feelings for her at one point. I was taken aback by that because like in a work scenario, I don't know when I would ever feel comfortable enough to tell someone that knowing they're married. Yeah. Yeah. That's bizarre to me. I think that maybe spoke to their closeness. Like, yeah, they started at the same time. They probably bitched about work. They probably talked about, you know, was it over drinks? Like, yeah. Yeah. And if you're carpooling, like carpooling, you're talking totally different life stuff than just work usually you know so it's like i've just i've had crushes on coworkers, but i would never yeah. do that unless you're like both certain, single at a holiday party yeah, or, or you're something. certain like i can't do this anymore we've got to be together or whatever uh, you know uh 
I feel like Portland is also like the polyamorous capital True. of the Western United States. I actually think it is. I <laughs> feel like, like taking something... your chance. I'm think... probably Polly. I think something came out that like it is. It's... I feel like I read that the other I've day. I've just heard. I've just. I've heard. Many, I've heard it. I've heard it a lot. You know, now that you say that, when I first had joined Bumble, I saw an old coworker on there that I'm like, wait, he's married. And then oh I read God. his bio and it said polyamorous. I'm like, oh, that things make sense now. Things make sense. It's all coming together. <laughs> Not single, looking to jingle. <laughs> yeah. So that could have been it. He's like, hey, are you guys into that? Are you down to or... But I, yeah, I think it does kind of show that maybe their off their whole office space was like that, like a little more casual. A little yeah, more yeah with like the threatening joke notes on the dry erase board. Right. And yeah, stuff. which yeah. is bizarre in its own. Like, how weird is that? I mean, we've definitely had like post-it wars in previous companies where you, I can see it happening. Oh, it, totally. But just right. what are the odds to have like already dead written four times? Oh, I know. And she was shot four times and then skull and cross. Like, but Josh, you're right when you had said like, they seem funny until you have to explain yeah. it to yeah. someone. You're like, you can't so stop true. laughing and you're like, well, let me tell you. And then it's like, oh, no. Yeah, I'm sure that let whoever, me stop talking. Whoever did it had to explain that to them. And they were just like, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I'm oh, so God. sorry. Well, I just think of times where I'm trying to explain something to Alicia that happened in my work. I'm like, it doesn't make sense <laughs> yeah. outside of, the, you know. I like, don't yeah. know Craig. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and that's important, too. Like, just work environments are so social and things just mesh together you know dating and hanging out and all that it's like where you meet people you got to be careful with it everybody's yeah. out to get everybody you know i started out with uh the episode it was just going to be mitra's case but as i kept researching i found that we're like there's so many different incidents and every single one has very really different like well they have commonalities but they're all they all generate from something different i feel like mm. it's just it's just really it was uh and just the the statistics I was I I kind of listed off there were startling as well. Just yeah. how many there are and and how often uh, previous domestic abuse plays a part in it. Mm-hmm. It's like seventy percent of the time. Well, and the biggest thing to take of all of it is lock up your guns or don't have them. That's the access. Like the guy having to put all of his weapons in a car and gr- drive it to his family, even though he obviously kept something. You know, it's like if they weren't on every corner. Most people have extreme emotions at some point, be it from a breakup, a divorce, a fight, a a work thing, a money thing. Like you get intense and maybe you also have PTSD. Maybe you also have something else going on. And if that gun is just sitting there, it's like, oh, here's an option. It's too easy to kill yourself with a gun here. Yeah. Another... Powerful, uplifting. uplifting (laughs) But it's food for thought. Like, yeah, it really is. Like, you're right about the access. Like, you cannot control other people's emotions and reactions. So, if you openly have something in your house, who knows? Like, your likelihood of being killed by Mm -hmm. a gun goes up. So, you don't want those available to people. Yeah. It's very sad. But thanks, Josh. It's important stuff. Thank you. The term homicide suicide is often used interchangeably with murder suicide. But it shouldn't be, as a homicide may be unintentional, and murder is always a deliberate act. Quote, In many respects, these murder suicides are society assisted suicides, suicides because of society's failures. The 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline provides free and confidential emotional support to people in suicidal crisis or emotional distress 24 hours a day, seven days a week across the United States. Simply call 988 or go to 988lifeline.org. Well, no one will know what that means. But the smart guys <laughs> and my dad. Oh, Keith likes crossbows? He does. Well, oh, that's I'd how like he... to have a talk with him about crossbows. I hope he makes sure when he's done to clean up all of the balloon remnants that are lying around the wilderness. <laughs> oh, my God. Before he goes home. You're ridiculous. Okay, let me get back to this. <laughs> Any chance I get, Keith. Any chance. You little sex maniac. <laughs> 
He's the horniest motherfucker I've ever heard of. <laughs> you, I haven't even told you the half of our recent conversation. Oh. So I can, oh, there, it came. I'll do it now. Oh. It came. Apple came. It went. Split. <laughs> Throw that D anywhere. Yeah. I could use a good D. <laughs> it's been a while. It's been a, it's been a long COVID. <laughs> Gmail us. <laughs> <laughs> that, did that sound all right? Did okay. I say liberty? Liberty, 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 liberty. Is expected to it. It's okay. It's all of us. You're embodying the three of us right, right now. <laughs> I am murder in the rain. <laughs> I try to direct it most at Alicia. Yeah, she's used to it. It's true. <laughs> All the just all the laughing I do all the time is making my throat. Oh God, tickle. I know, and it I'm makes me so miserable funny. just laughing all the time. It's so such much. horrible. <laughs> yep. God damn me for having good friends that make me laugh, and jokes being, that make me laugh, and for being so funny all the time. <laughs> that is exhausting. What's the old T-shirt saying? Jesus is my homeboy. Yeah, he's my wow. homeboy. He's my co-pilot. He's my my Take rotten the wheel, soldier. Jesus. <laughs> my sweet cheats. My good time boy. <laughs> Cubicle, cubicle, <laughs> <laughs> wet mouth, son of a bitch. <laughs> bep, 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 bep. Foyer, right? Yeah, or foyer. <laughs> yeah, I don't like foyer. Mm-mm. All right, classy bitch. I am. Yeah. I say my welcoming room. <laughs> <laughs> no, you would say I'm Canadian, <laughs> so it's foyer. Or I'd just be like, you know, that hallway out right <laughs> where my door the one starts. With the big vase in the middle. I like it called a mud room myself. <laughs> I, that's a different room for me. <laughs> it sure is. Ew. I thought you meant a different room in a house. You mean your butt. No, I meant the bathroom. Mm. <laughs> I did. He's slinging mud in there. If you Ew. know what I mean? Ooh, that was a good oh, one. Oh, wow. Who did that? Not me. me. <laughs> it was Emily. Oh, that made my butt concerned. That it was, was good. It, that like, was it was like in a... my headphones, and so my body is like, oh no, are you <laughs> My mouth trouble? was perfectly moist. It was like a hot <laughs> fart, like a really, <laughs> like a warning <laughs> fart. Yeah. You that gotta did get... things to me. Mm. And now I can't do it ever again. <laughs> Never. Like, I just had a strong cup of coffee. <laughs> yes. <laughs> things are activated. Um, it is on. I miss coffee. <laughs> the mudroom, baby. <laughs> I gotta take this to the mud room. I'm Better sorry. get your Wellington boots. <laughs> <laughs> I read too much British literature. Let me get my Wellington boots. <laughs> it's awfully muddy. Self roast. <laughs> or her appearances in appearances. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> Porridge. <laughs> it's delicious. First. <clears throat> First. <laughs> Nearly shattered my confidence with that one. I'm going to go get a spider now. <laughs> yeah, don't forget about that. How cool that was. Touched, I, I grabbed it with my hands and took it outside. And threw it. I saw you whisper to it, Threw too. it into a Christmas tree. <laughs> Maury's work ch- schedule changed. What's a schedule? Schedule? It's a schedule made out of cheese. <laughs> Yum. I never know where to go because I always eat it too fast. <laughs> Monday is mozzarella. <laughs> Tuesday is monster. Wednesday is cheddar. Wax covered baby bell. Mm, I love that. Thursday is mm, taco cheese. Taco cheese. <laughs> Excuse me. A three cheese taco blend. Yeah, she works in a in a little mine. She's building me a Hyundai. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still mad about that. Oh, that children, children built your Hyundai? That my car was like probably built by children. Oh, dear. From where? Uh, Alabama, I think. Oh, oh dear. Really? Didn't expect that. Yeah, it was like two months ago. They busted a plant that had a bunch of kids in I it. have never heard of this. Yep. Are you kidding well, me? because they buried it. I am looking quick. it up right now. That's not my web browser. <laughs> Fuck. Welcome back to America's <clears throat> Favorite Game Show. That's not my web browser. <laughs> Firefox. Ew, that's not my web browser. <laughs> Sometimes I'm on it. I'm not socially awkward at all. Everyone thinks I'm an extrovert. And then there are days where I'm like, say, you know, saying things backwards. Ew. You know, mixing stuff up. I don't know what's happening. Sick. Oh, what? Yeah, what a loser. Like mixing my words up. Oh, because you know? you're like, you get, yes, I see. 
like me just all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I am kerfuffle. <laughs> <laughs> as Jim had even loaned the couple the money they need. As Jim had even loaned the couple the money they need. As Jim had even loaned the couple the money they needed. Jesus Christ. As Jim had even loaned the couple. As Jim had even loaned the couple the money they need. They <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. I've fucking been there. Had even loaned the couple the money they needed. Did, did. <laughs> <laughs> Although bread. 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 Good old bread. Jesus Christ. I call him sourdough for short. And she. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Diane Morgan. I'm scared. <laughs> 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 I'm getting good at this shit. Murder in the Rain is a Cascade Media production. Written and hosted by Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough. Edited by Josh McCullough. You can always contact us at murderintherain at gmail.com or through our website, murderintherain.com. If you just can't get enough of Murder in the Rain, for as little as $5 a month, you'll have exclusive access to bonus episodes at patreon.com. You can find us on all of the socials, and for more true crime, follow at M underscore Murder in the Rain on TikTok, and you can also listen to Alicia and Josh on their other show, Always Be My Sisters. And suck my balls. <laughs>